If you are trying to get your head around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then stories and whose stories are told, heard and believed are of crucial importance. Frequently, there is a contest over the stories as though it were a zero-sum game in which there are only two stories and everyone must choose one and reject the other. It's a poisonous attitude. In the land that gave us the Bible, which we are gathered to listen to tonight, one current story goes like this. The Jewish people have been one of the most persecuted people in history. Their ancestral stories and their dreams for the future have been bound up with the land of Israel for more than 3,000 years. Over and over through history, they have been dragged out or driven out of the land and forced to live under hostile conquerors who have sought to eliminate their stories, their religion, their cultural identity, their dreams. In the Second World War, a major Christian European power sought to wipe them off the face of the earth, and more than six million were slaughtered. Those who survived were traumatized beyond belief, and the scars of that trauma have been passed down through the generations. Many, many Jews, even several generations removed from those events, can tell you how unanticipated hostility can trigger paralyzing trauma deep in their bodies. With the UN's blessing, modern Israel was created after that war to give these traumatized people a homeland, safe from those who wanted to destroy them. But five weeks ago, a huge band of Hamas terrorists broke through Israel's borders and brutally slaughtered more than 1,300 people, mostly civilians, and abducted 240 more. Since then, Hamas and their allies have fired thousands of missiles into Israeli towns and cities. Trauma, trauma, and more trauma. That's one story. It is unquestionably true. But there is another story in the same land, equally true, and it goes like this. The Palestinian people's deep roots in this land go back at least to the 7th century and perhaps even back to the ancient Canaanite people before the time of Moses and Joshua. Many Palestinian communities initially supported the creation of modern Israel and welcomed the Jews with open arms, but it quickly turned sour for them. In 1948, in what Israel calls, calls the War of Independence and the Palestinians call the disaster, about 700,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled by Israeli forces. Most of them remain stateless to this day, including those who still live in the Palestinian territories, Gaza and the West Bank, under a brutal Israeli-imposed system that objectively fulfills the definition of apartheid. Their homes are bulldozed, their movements restricted, and their children arrested and imprisoned for throwing rocks. The Palestinians, too, are deeply scarred by generational trauma. Most Palestinians have long opposed Hamas, but immediately after the Hamas attacks five weeks ago, the Israeli military began bombing Gaza. They blocked critical supplies, food, medicines, water, electricity and fuel from going in, and they blocked almost anyone from going out. At least 11,000 people have been killed in the bombing of Gaza so far, and another 2,700 are missing and probably trapped or dead under the rubble. Even Israel's figures on how many Hamas terrorists have been killed reveal that 99.5% of those who have been killed have been Palestinian civilians, almost 70% of them women and children. That alone objectively constitutes a war crime, a massive breach of international law, but the world has turned a blind eye. Until the French president spoke out yesterday, not one major Western power had even called for a ceasefire. Trauma, trauma, and more trauma. Don't let anyone tell you that you have to choose between these stories. 
They are both factually true. They both deserve to be told. They are both about people who love the land and who deserve to live in peace. And the conflict cannot be understood or properly responded to as long as either of those stories is not being heard. There's another story that needs to be heard too if we are to fully understand what's going on. And we heard a little extract from it tonight in our first Bible reading. The book of Joshua does not feature very highly in our cycle of Sunday Bible readings, just three times in three years, but two of them were last Sunday and this. Mostly, I'm glad that there's not too much of it because there's much in the book of Joshua that makes my skin crawl. But in light of what is taking place in Israel and the Palestinian territories right now, I don't think we can afford to be ignorant of this story and its impact on what is going on. The ideological conclusions that both Christians and Jews draw from the book of Joshua are literally a matter of life or death for Palestinian women and children right now. They're a matter of life or death for Indigenous people here in Australia too. And if you think that sounds a little bit far-fetched, just listen to this. The three bits that do make it into our cycle of readings are some of the more benign passages. But listen to this line from last week's extract. Joshua said, You shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. Now imagine that would how that would sound to us if it said the living God will without fail drive out from the land before you the Wurundjeri, Bunwurrung, Yorta Yorta, Gadigal, Wiradjuri, Walpuri, and Waka Waka peoples. That last one is Uncle Den's mob. If the Bible said that, we would feel sick to our guts. But the truth is that the first version I read out is no less sick. And the second is exactly what the biblical version was interpreted to mean by settler colonizers in this land, around the world, and in Israel. The extract we heard tonight, no doubt included for the much loved line, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord includes a reference in the very same sentence to the Amorites in whose land you are living. So it doesn't even try to pretend that the traditional ownership is the other way around. And just three verses later, as the people respond to that call to choose, they say, we also will serve the Lord because the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. If you don't know much of the Bible other than the parts that we read in worship, you may not be familiar with the book of Joshua as a whole. So let me give you the very brief summary. This book forms the bridge between the ancient stories that lead up to the exodus of the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt under the leadership of Moses to the later stories of the establishment of a kingdom of Israel under the first kings, Saul, David and Solomon. The book begins with the Israelite people on the border of Canaan and Moses having just died. Joshua, son of Nun, is Moses' chosen successor. He parts the Jordan River as Moses has, had parted the Red Sea and leads the people across into the land of Canaan. The bulk of the book is then taken up with telling how, beginning with the city of Jericho, they invaded and conquered the land and divided it up among the 12 tribes of Israel. What most disturbs us when we read this book is the violent conquest it describes, which ticks all the boxes of settler colonialism and genocide and portrays God as commanding it. If you were to take a full and frank account of the atrocities committed against Aboriginal peoples by British colonisers here in Australia and portray God as unquestionably on the side of the perpetrators, you would have something that sounded and felt like the book of Joshua. 
we are explicitly told that the Israelites killed everyone in Jericho, men and women, young and old, and also killed the cattle, sheep and donkeys, and then went on to do similarly in other parts of the country. Even those who believe that war is often justified and who can therefore accept the death of active combatants know that a line has been crossed when non-combatant women, children and livestock are killed simply for being there. That's not war. That's war crimes. That's genocide. Inspiring phrases like, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, sound noble when heard in isolation, but in their context, they are part of a pledge to a genocidal colonialist project. Now, one of the strange things about this is that unlike our history of hiding and minimizing the accounts of our genocidal colonialism in Australia, the book of Joshua probably greatly exaggerates the exact aspects of the story that most disturb us. Because there is no archaeological evidence and no written evidence outside of the Bible that an invasion and conquest on this scale ever occurred. Even within the book of Joshua, there are traces of evidence of a much more gradual and peaceful settlement and assimilation. And there are much more historically plausible explanations for the emergence of the Israelites as a distinct people with their own religion. But that doesn't matter now, because the book of Joshua is not read as history, it is read as scripture. That is to say, its stories tell us who we are and how we are related to God and to God's purposes in the world. And that's why, when the book of Joshua is allowed to be the centerpiece of scripture, it becomes so dangerous and poisonous to the world. In the form we have it now, the book of Joshua was probably compiled to inspire and encourage the Israelite people as they returned to Canaan from their exile in Babylon. Its message to a traumatized and fearful people was don't be afraid. God has delivered this land over to you before and will surely give it back to you now. God is with you and no one can stand against you. The land is yours, a gift from God. Put Joshua alongside books like Ezra and Nehemiah that describe the return to Canaan after the Babylonian exile. And you'll find a huge agenda of employing the tools of ethnic cleansing to assert and protect the ethnic purity of Israel. But even in the, the pre-Christian Hebrew Bible, this was not a voice that went unchallenged. For example, while those three books railed against intermarriage and commanded Israelite men to divorce their non-Israelite wives and send them and their children off destitute, a classic ethnic cleansing strategy. Other books of the Hebrew Bible defiantly hold up non-Israelite wives as great heroes and focus more attention on the biblical commands to show love and generous hospitality to strangers in the land, especially the poor and vulnerable. So even within the Hebrew Bible, the Joshua agenda has serious critics. But for those of us who would follow Jesus, the rejection of Joshua's agenda is unmistakable. Jesus was clearly not a fan. Given that the name Jesus is the Greek translation of Joshua, John got it exactly right when he misread it before, Joshua is Jesus, you would think that Jesus might be drawn to the book that bore his name, but no. It is one of the few books in the Hebrew Bible that Jesus never quotes or appeals to. It seems that Jesus wanted nothing to do with the Joshua agenda. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for many who have claimed allegiance to Jesus over the centuries since. The book of Joshua has been claimed throughout the history of European imperialism to provide a religious ideological justification for settler colonialism, that is, the deliberate process of one society moving in to supplant another, 
occupying its land and usually regarding it, the original inhabitants as dispensable. Settler colonialism, backed up by the book of Joshua, was an openly held policy of the European colonial powers, including those who planted the British flag in Australia. As can be seen in major examples like Australia and America, the settler colonizers usually portrayed the indigenous inhabitants as wasting, misusing or afflicting the land and therefore needing to be subdued and vanquished so that the invaders could impose order and properly employ the land. As had been the intention with the book of Joshua in its origins, the national identity of these new co um, colonies was constructed around stories of brave conquest. Returning to modern Israel and its reoccupation of the lands of the Palestinian peoples, we see this ideological use of the Joshua agenda on steroids. Because, of course, now we are not just extrapolating it to other peoples and lands. We are seeing those who claim descent from the original chosen people of the story reclaiming the specific land which the book of Joshua says was promised to their forebears by God and was to be taken by eliminating the indigenous inhabitants. The expanding Jewish settlements in the Palestinian West Bank, clearly illegal under international law, are an obvious continuation of this policy of settler colonialism, with Palestinian communities being literally bulldozed aside. There are Jewish Zionist extremists today who openly say that the reason there is no peace in Israel today is because they failed to obey God by completely eliminating the indigenous inhabitants in the days of Joshua and because they failed to finish the job again in 1948, and that the only solution is to finish the job now. And while the majority of the Israeli leadership would not employ such extreme rhetoric, that Joshua mythology clearly underpins the genocidal apartheid policies with which Israel oppresses the Palestinian people. I'm not making a subjective negative judgment in using those words like apartheid. The policies easily fulfill the UN definitions of those words, and even a former chief of Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, has described the current practice as apartheid. Some South African visitors have said that it is worse than what occurred in their country. Another story must be acknowledged too. And that is that there are many Jews in the world today who oppose Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands and oppose this war and are horrified by what is being done in their name. Many Jews have always opposed the creation of the modern state of Israel, believing that their faith taught that they were to remain in diaspora and not return to the lands of Canaan until the Messiah came. So anti-Zionism, far from being automatically anti-Semitic, as the right-wing Israeli leadership deceptively asserts, is in fact a relatively common position in the Jewish community. There are many Christians today, especially American evangelicals, who maintain a largely unquestioning support of not only Israel's right to exist, but its right to violently oppress the ordinary Palestinian people and repress their hopes for freedom and independence. They weaponize two biblical ideas to justify this unwavering support. One is the Joshua agenda, which most Christians would no longer support in other colonial projects, but are still willing to support in the context of its original geographic location. And the other is a weird reading of the end time prophecies in parts like First Thessalonians that we heard tonight and in Revelation, which they understand to mean that the return of the Jews to Israel is something that must happen before Jesus will return. So they support it unquestionably. As a result, the Christian church has been absolutely complicit in allowing Israel to maintain its self-destructive policies of repressing the Palestinians. 
I say self-destructive because no matter how understandable Israel's urge to seek vengeance for the horrific atrocities committed against them may be, even if they succeed in completely destroying Hamas, their illegal and indiscriminate methods will have sown seeds of rage and despair in the next generation of Palestinian youth that will inevitably grow into something even worse than Hamas. Israel, which was created to provide a safe homeland for persecuted Jews, has now become the most unsafe place on earth to be a Jew. So what we are seeing when we read the book of Joshua and this current conflict side by side is an urgent reminder of the life and death perils of building policies on one strand of biblical thought without allowing other, sometimes even more developed strands of biblical thought to engage in critical dialogue with it. As much as I don't like the book of Joshua, it is important that we continue to hear it because without an understanding of history, we are doomed to repeat its mistakes. So when we hear Joshua say, therefore choose this day whom you will serve, we may now be being called to choose between serving Joshua's agenda and serving Jesus's agenda. The Bible speaks elsewhere of God's people being called to be a light to the nations. And tonight we heard Jesus's parable of the 10 bridesmaids, five of whom were able to continue to shine their light and five of whom weren't. Perhaps like the wise five whose lights continued to shine, we are being called to recognize the foolishness of expecting that, the on, that only the oil once given is enough. And instead, to know that our faith and our understanding of the Bible and its relevance to the world need to be continually replenished if the light is going to continue to shine. Therefore, choose this day who you will serve. The warmongers and oppressors like Hamas and the Israeli Defence Force, who both think that the slaughter of civilians can be religiously and politically justified. Or Jesus, who says, what you do to the least of these Palestinian children, you do to me. Therefore, choose life.